Hello, everyone. I'm uh, James Beck um, from the Parkinson's Foundation, and I want to welcome you to the fifth uh, in the series of our 10th expert briefings. Um, today's topic is going to be PD and medications. What's new? Um, I, as I said, I'm uh, Jim Beck. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of the Parkinson's Foundation. It's my pleasure to have you uh, listening in today because we have a really wonderful talk. And um, just want to remind you, as I always do, that you know, these webinars we create um, with the input from the community. Um, we rely on our colleagues at the um, Alliance of Independent Regional Parkinson's Organizations, and we rely on you, um, people in the Parkinson's community, to give us feedback. Um, you'll notice at the end of our presentation there will be a, a survey to take, so we encourage you to, to fill out the survey and give us the feedback that's necessary. Um, if you want to download the slides for uh, Dr. Pawa's presentation, you know, on the viewing screen, right below his picture, there's a big blue box that says Download Slides. So click on that, and you can download a copy of the slides to look at later um, or take notes on. Um, if you're a health professional, you can earn one free CEU through the American Society of Aging. So you have to register it as a health professional and, and indicate that you'd like the CEUs. And so you'll have um, an email at the end of the day that will tell you um, the additional steps you need in order to collect that CEU. But remember, you only have 30 days, which is until May 9th, uh, to collect your free CEU. So it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Rajesh Pawa. Um, Dr. Pawa is a Laverne and Joyce Ryder Professor of Neurology at the University of Kansas Medical Center. He's also Chief um, of the Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Division and Director of our Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence at the University of Kansas. Medical Center. You know, Dr. Pawa received his medical degree at um, SSF GS Medical College in the University of Bombay in India, and he completed an internship in medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, another one of our centers of excellence, followed by a residency um, in neurology, um, also in Baylor. Um, he then completed a fellowship in movement disorders at the University of Kansas Medical Center, which is where he is now. You know, Dr. Pawa is a diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. And his research interests are centered around the various aspects of Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. He's been conducting clinical trials for over 20 years and is currently involved in studies related to medical and surgical forms of therapies for Parkinson's disease. The Center of Excellence that um, Dr. Pawa leads is at University of Kansas is one of the largest clinical trial sites in the United States. Dr. Pawa has published, uh, as you can imagine, extensively um, about Parkinson's disease and related movement disorders. And he's co-editor of the Handbook of Parkinson's Disease for third and fourth editions, um, Therapy of Parkinson's Disease, and Handbook of Essential Tremor and Other Tremor Disorders. So uh, as you can hear that uh, Dr. Pawa's topic, uh, what's new with medications, is right up his alley. He's, in fact, probably been uh, had some experience with some of the medications which are currently in clinical trials today. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Pawa. Thank you, Jim, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, for everyone of you who joined uh, my talk today. Uh, it is uh, a very exciting time for a Parkinson's disease treatment. Uh, I remember time uh, 15 years ago, if I were to do a talk like this, uh, I might have maybe one new medication and maybe three or four new medications coming up in the near future. Uh, I would like to start off by pointing out what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the new medicines we have had over the past couple of years and the new medicines that are going to be available uh, in the United States over the past couple of years. So there are multiple medications being tested right now. In fact, uh, at this time, we have uh, medications which we are testing for multiple indications in Parkinson's all the way from slowing the disease progression uh, all the way into helping non-motor symptoms, whether it's orthostatic hypotension, whether it's psychosis. So there's a lot of studies going on. And I just wanted to focus on the next two years because I could talk for the next five hours talking about each of the medicines that are being tested uh, right now in clinical trials. Uh, the other point I would like to point out is since it's the next two years, I'm not going to be talking about uh, a lot of people have interest in finding out about stem cells or gene therapies, which are a little further away from two years before we would actually uh, be doing uh, phase three clinical trials that they are uh, going to be available in the near future. Uh, before I start, I want to let you know because a number of clinical trials, and I do uh, have a lot of uh, uh, disclosures to make as far as the companies and other things are concerned, and this is my slide that you have downloaded if needed. 
So there are still a number of unmet needs when it comes to the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So just to trying to summarize some of the major unmet needs we have, and by unmet needs, I mean that even though we may have treatment, we still struggle in managing patients with these conditions. Uh, for example, off time, including demand therapies, and I'll talk about each or at least the ones that we have treatments uh, down the road here. Uh, dyskinesias, which are the involuntary movements that occur. Psychosis, that's the hallucinations and delusions that go with Parkinson's. Orthostatic hypertension, which is low blood pressure on standing and, and syncopal episodes, as well as constipation and urinary problems. Then we have cognitive issues, including dementia. Like I mentioned, a couple of our big ones, slowing of disease progression, we have a number of studies ongoing, but I don't believe any of them are that close that, that we'll have it available in the next couple of years. And finally, falls, which is a huge burden both to the patient and the caregiver. Uh, but again, that is something way down the future where if we have uh, treatments for the same. So what I plan to cover are the new treatments, like I mentioned in the last couple of years, and the future treatments, which are going to come in the next couple of years. Uh, usually when I do presentations uh, of new medicine, I like to only use generic names. But when I talk to patient groups, it often comes down as they are more familiar with the branded rather than the generic names. And that's why I've included both of them. So if we look at uh, PD psychosis, uh, we have Pemavacerine or Neuplazid that was approved uh, for orthostatic hypertension. We had Droxidopa, uh, commercially known as Northera. Uh, for off time, we had Carbidopa, Levodopa, Enteral Suspension, also known as Diopa in the United States. Uh, Safinamide, uh, Zadago. And then we had one on-demand therapy approved, that is Levodopa inhalation, uh, that's in Brigia. Uh, we had our first medicine approved for dyskinesias in Parkinson's, amantadine ER, or Gocovery, and our first uh, medication, which is actually an injection for drooling, uh, which is a botulinum toxin injection, Zeomian. In the near future, what we are going to have is another on-demand therapy, epimorphine sublingual, another one for drooling, botulinum toxin injection, myoblock, uh, then for off time, we have an adenosine A2 antagonist, estradefinil, subcutaneous epimorphine infusion, as well as subcutaneous carbidopa, levodopa infusion, and finally, other extended forms of carbidopa, levodopa preparations. So let's talk a little bit about hallucinations and psychosis. So what is psychosis? It is when Parkinson's patients start either seeing, hearing, smelling, or uh, imagining things that are not there. And, and one of the most common things that people do is see uh, little people, uh, little children out there when, in fact, these children are not there. Of course, this could occur once a month initially, once a week, or it could get to the point that it is being seen more and more frequently. Uh, people could have illusions where you see a certain object and looks something different. For example, rope may look like a snake. Then you have a false sense of presence when people feel someone else is in the room or someone is overlooking over their shoulder when there is not there. And delusions where are false beliefs. Someone is stealing from you. Someone is trying to hurt you. So presence of any of these hallucinations, illusions, false selves of presence or delusions would suggest that person may be having some degree of PD psychosis. Like I mentioned earlier, it could happen once a month. It could happen every day. In the studies that are out there, about 50% of the patients will develop these symptoms sometime over the disease course. The longer a person has the disease, they are much more likely to have this. This can happen with or without people who have memory problems, People who are taking Parkinson's medicine, since all Parkinson's medicines can cause psychosis to some point, or patients who are not on any medications for their psychosis. It can occur with or without insight, and by that I mean that there are people early in the disease will know these are not true because they may feel, okay, there is an elephant sitting in my office, but there cannot be an elephant in my office, 
and people have told me because of my Parkinson medicine, I can imagine that. And they may blink a few times and the elephant may go away or they may even walk over and touch the elephant and realize it's not there. Or they may lose insight that when they see this, they truly believe there is an elephant in the office, which could be very upsetting. So, so far, this has been a big challenge for us because from the patient standpoint, they can get very upset, they can be very disabling. Once the hallucinations or psychosis begins, because all Parkinson's medications can cause it, we often hesitate in giving medicines for motor symptoms. We often, in fact, start reducing medications for the motor symptoms, which results in patients having more of a tremor, more physical difficulties, because they're not getting enough of the Parkinson medicine. We also know in one study, this was the second most reason after motor symptoms that the patients with Parkinson's ended up in the ER because of the hallucinations. And uh, if these hallucinations and uh, delusions become very bothersome, it becomes extremely difficult for the caregiver to manage the person at home, and they often have to end up taking them to the nursing home. From the caregiver standpoint, they start having issues uh, because of the a denial by the patient and the caregiver trying to convince them there are no hallucinations. And that's why we often recommend that the caregiver not argue with the patient if they see a rat running around that it is really not a rat because that's just going to cause more problems between the patient and the caregiver. The caregiver often has to be more concerned about the patient, so it increases their burden. They often have more anxiety, depression, and their own physical issues taking care of a patient with Parkinson's psychosis. So over the years, uh, we used to use medications which were used for schizophrenia to help patients when they were having these psychosis symptoms. The challenge with the medications that are currently available, uh, which were uh, available for schizophrenia that we were using for Parkinson's psychosis, is all of those medications can affect the chemical dopamine which is already reduced in Parkinson's disease. So what was happening is in some patients, there was much worsening of the motor symptoms. So even though they may be helped as far as the psychosis was concerned, the end result was that their motor symptoms were worse, just like we were experiencing that cutting back the medicine. So when Timavacerine was approved about a little over two years ago, it was our first and only approved medication for Parkinson's psychosis. Unlike the other antipsychotics which are approved for schizophrenia, at this time, Pemavacerine is only approved for patients with Parkinson's having psychosis, and because it does not act on dopamine but acts on another chemical serotonin, it doesn't worsen Parkinson's symptoms. So the motor symptoms do not get worse with Neuplasic. The other thing is in clinical trials, as well as in my personal experience, majority of the patients do get benefit in their psychosis with Neuplasic. Now you can have patients about 10 to 15% where there's complete resolution of the psychosis, and then you have a group of patients where the psychosis is better, it's more uh, something that they can understand and have not something occurring frequently all the time. Uh, so that can also happen. It's used once a day, and in addition to helping the hallucinations, delusions, uh, it also helps the nighttime sleep, it helps with the daytime sleepiness, and the other thing is also helps with the caregiver burden, so maybe the patient is sleeping better, the caregiver is sleeping better, and they feel better too. And the most common side effects we see are nausea, confusion, and in some people actually worsening of the hallucinations. Let's move to the next uh, one, which is for also a non-motor symptom of Parkinson's disease, which is orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension is when there is a fall in blood pressure when the person stands up, and this causes lightheadedness, dizziness, feeling of passing out, or in extreme cases, even passing out. But what happens is there are certain other symptoms that are often not seen as commonly but can occur and often a person does not realize it is due to low blood pressure is just generalized weakness. When person stands up, the legs give way, generalized fatigue, 
slowing of thinking because the blood is not making it to the brain, vision problems, headache, neck pain, and chest pain. Now, what happens with orthostatic hypertension when the person stands up, the blood pressure drops, and if the blood pressure is too low, it does not have enough pressure to, for the blood to go to the brain. So it's like a person, the brain living on the second floor, and the pump is not working, so the water is not quite making it to the second floor. And because the brain is not getting the blood, different organs or different parts of the brain are affected. And the most common one we see is passing out, which is the extreme one. But as you see, there are other symptoms that can also occur. This is typically worse in the morning because person has been sleeping uh, flat all night in the bed when they stand up. Uh, it does not react as well. They have not taken any fluids all night. In fact, they have gone to the bathroom a few times uh, at night, and that's why it's worse in the, in the mornings. The other thing, it can be worse after meals, that a person takes meals and they have more blood flowing into the gut and not enough to make it to the brain. Now, orthostatic hypotension can occur with multiple conditions, but one of the most common causes is Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease can cause orthostatic hypertension, and about 20% of the Parkinson's patients have it symptomatic. In other words, not only is the blood pressure dropping when they stand up, but also causing the symptoms. We have been using other medications, but in spite of that, we have been struggling in helping patients with orthostatic hypertension. Droxidopa, also known as Northera, was approved recently for symptoms of lightheadedness or feeling of passing out. It is believed to increase the chemical non-epinephrine. It should be taken three times a day, roughly at eight, 12, and four. And you start at a very low dose, 100 milligrams three times a day, and it has to be increased to 600 milligrams three times a day. When people are lying flat in bed, the blood pressure is fine because it's like it doesn't have to go to the first floor or second floor where the brain is because right now the brain is at the lower level, so blood is flowing into the brain fine. It's when they stand up or sit up when you start having problems. So we recommend not taking it about five hours before bedtime because when a person is lying in flat in bed, they are gonna have some degree of high blood pressure. The other challenge that occurs treating orthostatic hypertension is the person is never uh, going to have that perfect blood pressure. It's always going to be a little bit low when people have symptoms or a little bit on the higher side. Uh, with Northera, there have, you know, there is a significant improvement in these lightheadedness symptoms, but the most common side effects that can occur, of course, is high blood pressure, especially on lying down, uh, headaches, uh, you could still have dizziness, nausea, and fatigue. And again, it's not going to help every patient out there but it's an additional medication we have to treat orthostatic hypertension. So I'm gonna shift gears here and talk a little bit about motor symptoms. And I'm gonna talk about one of the unmet needs that is off time. Well, what is off time? Well, levodopa, as uh, people are aware of, is the most efficacious medication we have for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. The way levodopa works, it goes into the brain and it's converted to dopamine. And as you know, dopamine is one of the chemicals that is reduced in Parkinson's disease. When you first initiate levodopa, patients have control of their motor symptoms throughout the day and night. In other words, once they are on the medicine, whatever their symptoms might be, whether it's tremor, whether it's slowness, whether it's walking difficulty, it gets better. And then if they forget to take a dose, forget to take a medication for two days, they go on a vacation and they forget it even for a week and their symptoms are still under control. And this provides control throughout the day and night. However, over time, patients start having off time and we believe roughly 40% of the patients will develop over five years and 90% in 10 years. So what is off time? It is the time during the day when the person's Parkinson's symptoms either return or worsen. So let's say someone wakes up <coughs> in the mornings and as mornings often are the best time of the day, they may not, not have any motor symptoms. They take their medications, but before their next dose is due, they have their tremor comes back, they may have the 
slowness comes back, they may have cramping come back, and that's when they go into an off state. They take their next medication and their symptoms get better again, and they are doing fine. So that off state was aborted. So they are kind of beginning to have this little roller coaster. They take their medicine, their symptoms are under control, which we call on, and then they get worse, which we call off, and that's the roller coaster some patients can have during the day. Now, person can have both motor symptoms during off as well as non-motor symptoms. So motor symptoms could be tremor, could be slowness, could be stiffness, could be balance difficulties. On the other hand, non-motor symptoms could be cloudy thinking, aching, anxiety, tiredness. So it could be both motor or non-motor. These symptoms are often unique for a person. So a person A, when they are off, they may have just tremors. On the other hand, a person B may get anxious when their medicine is wearing off, plus have tremors. So this roller coaster, as the disease progresses, not only becomes more unpredictable, but at times it is difficult to manage even with medications. So when we look at these different off periods, we have patients who wake up in the morning and they are off, and that is called early morning off. So when they wake up, they don't really get the best benefit of sleep, so have maybe tremor, slowness, they have to take their medications to start feeling better. And then one of the most common is the wearing off. They take a medication, and before their next dose is due, their symptoms return, and that's often known as end-of-dose wearing off. Then we have a delayed on, where a person takes the medication, and it takes a while for the medication to start working, and that's known as delayed on. And finally, you have dose failures, that a person takes a dose, and it doesn't work at all, and they have to wait till their next dose before the symptoms improve. Now, these are some of the commonly off periods, and, and a single individual patient could have an early morning off, could have wearing off, could have a delayed on, or could have even days, dose failure, so they could have all these off periods in a single day. When we add up all the off periods that a person is getting during the day, this results in the total off time they have during the day. So that's kind of the difference between off periods and off time. All the off periods together result in what is the off time during the day. So one of the medications, levodopa, was approved to be provided in a gel and could be used with a pump to provide continuously throughout the day. So it wasn't that a person had to remember to take five doses, six doses a day. They put the pump on in the morning. They leave it on all day. Some people even use it 24 hours. So providing the medication more continuously was shown to reduce off time as well as off periods during the day. So what it involves is putting a small tube through the stomach into the part of the small intestine called jejunum because that's where levodopa is absorbed. This tube is then con connected to a pump, and the pump has a cassette where the levodopa gel is present and every um, morning, a new cassette is put in to provide the gel. And the dose that a person needs, whether it's the first thing in the morning, whether it's during the day, whether they need extra doses for some reason during the day, can be provided by the pump, and the patient has some independence on using this pump. So who are candidates for the pump? Because we don't offer this pump for every patient who has Parkinson's disease, not only because it is a hassle carrying a pump around, but if the medications orally through the mouth are working, one doesn't need a pump to provide the same therapy. So first of all, a person has to have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, not a diagnosis of atypical Parkinson's. Secondly, the symptoms have to improve with levodopa. Other oral medications have been used with levodopa, and a patient continues to have at least off time of about three hours a throughout the day. They can manage the pump or they have someone, a caregiver who can help them manage the pump. And since this tube is placed, placed in the stomach, there is no reason that they cannot undergo abdominal surgery. So DOPA helps not only the off time during the day, but also the dyskinesias because it provides levodopa more continuously. The next medication that was recently approved is safinamide, and commercial name is Zadago. 
Uh, this is an MAOB inhibitor, and there are other MAOB inhibitors already available in United States, such as rosagiline and selegiline. It is believed that safinamide may have additional benefits over MAOB inhibition, and that's the hope behind safinamide. It is used along with levodopa to reduce off time and off periods during the day. It is available in two doses, 50 and 100 milligrams, and there are certain medications that cannot be used with safinamide, such as opioid drugs like tramadol, mepridine, muscle relaxants like cyclobenzapine, amphetamine like compounds, St. John's Ward, the cough medication, dextromethorphane, certain antidepressants, etc. So those are important points to remember. In a person, when they came in the study, had a roughly an off time of six hours, and this was reduced by about an hour a day. So in spite of Zadago, patients did have off time, but in addition to levodopa, it can definitely reduce off time is an option in some patients. So the other thing that was actually approved earlier this year is orally inhaled levodopa, also known as imbregia. I talked to you about off periods and delayed on. So at times when a person takes a levodopa medication, it may take minutes to even hours before the medication actually starts working because the medication has to go from the mouth to the stomach, from the stomach into the small intestine where levodopa is absorbed, and from there into the brain. And at times, levodopa can stay in the stomach because gastric emptying may be slowed down, so it may take forever for levodopa to make it to the jejunum and small intestine. Using inhalation levodopa, the levodopa is delivered into the lungs and from the lungs into the blood and then the brain. So it is kind of a faster a way to provide levodopa. It can be used up to five times a day. So if a person, you know, needs it up to five times for whatever reason, they had delayed on, they had a dose failure, uh, they can take it up to five times a day. It is used with a special inhaler. And even though you have to use two capsules at a time, you can only put one capsule in the inhaler at a time for a total of two capsules per dose. The off time begins to improve as soon as 10 minutes, and the benefit can last up to an hour with this. The main side effect seen with orally inhaled levodopa, that's in Bregia, is cough. So let's move on to another part of uh, levodopa therapy, that's levodopa-induced dyskinesias. Not only do we end up seeing off periods and off time with levodopa, but in some patients, they can develop levodopa-induced dyskinesias, which are involuntary dance-like movements that occur in patients on levodopa. It's important to differentiate this with tremors because tremors usually occurs when there is not enough medicine, and dyskinesias usually occurs when there is too much medicine. We can, of course, reduce the levodopa to cut down the dyskinesias, but then the end result is that the patient has more motor symptoms, more tremor, more sl uh, slowness, and this often leads to undertreatment. This can bother the patient plus the caregiver, and it can be very disabling and can limit activities of daily living, cause pain, cause embarrassment, and also call falls due to balance difficulties. So amantadine ER capsules or GoCovery was the first medication in the United States that was approved for the treatment of dyskinesias. It not only helps the dyskinesias, but also reduces off time. So in a way, it is our first approved medication, not only for the dyskinesias, but for reducing both dyskinesias and off time. It acts on multiple chemicals in the brain, but we believe the action for off time and dyskinesias might be more related to glutamate. It is very important to remember to take this medication before bedtime, not in the mornings, because what happens is it takes about four hours at night after the drug is taken where the drug doesn't get into the system and then gradually gets into the system through the night. So when the patient wakes up in the morning, they have enough amantadine in their blood for it to work right away. It provides control of dyskinesias throughout the day, and its main side effects are hallucinations and lightheadedness. 
It is important to differentiate this with immediate release amantadine that has been available over 40 years. Immediate release amantadine is used two to three times during the day. And there is another form of amantadine ER capsules called Osmolex, which are given in the morning and they are not approved for dyskinesias or off time. Do we have data showing that they reduce off time or dyskinesias? But we want to make sure that when a drug is prescribed, they know which form of amantadine they are getting, and it's only Gocovery amantadine ER that is approved and we know helps off time and dyskinesias. One of the other major issues that Parkinson's patients have is excessive drooling. And this drooling can cause wetness around the mouth, skin breakdown around the mouth, call, cause foul odor, be an embarrassment. The saliva itself sitting in the throat can cause choking for certain patients. And even though there are some medicines that have been used for drooling, often they don't help the patient as well as cause side effects. So using botulinum toxin injections, which requires about two injections on the face on each side, and these injections are required every three to four months, was the first approved medication for excessive drooling. So with this, I'm going to shift gears and talk about some of the future therapies that are going to be available, hopefully, in the next couple of years. The first one is sublingual epimorphine. Epimorphine injections have been approved and available not only in the United States, but in multiple other countries in Europe and other parts of the world to help with off episodes. Now, epimorphine as a drug cannot be given orally through the mouth that can be swallowed because it cannot make it through the blood and be available for benefits. So we have to provide epimorphine through other ways. Currently, we do is give it as an injection under the skin, but a lot of patients don't like to take injections. They don't feel comfortable with injections. Whatever the reason may be, this therapy has not gotten its full potential because epimorphine can be as beneficial as levodopa. So right now, studies have just been completed for sublingual epimorphine strip. So it's kind of a little thin strip that a person places under the tongue, and taking that, the symptoms improve in about 15 minutes and last for about, the benefit lasts for about 90 minutes. This is used exclusively for off periods during the day, and we believe the person may be able to use it up to five times during the day. The main side effects are nausea, sleepiness, and dizziness. Another thing that will be next in line for approval, we believe, is another form of botulinum toxin injections called myoblock. Currently, myoblock is widely used for drooling, which is considered off-label, it is available for treatment of dystonia injections. Uh, the thing with myoblock is it'll have more, it has more flexible uh, dosing. And of course, like with any injection of botulinum toxin in the mouth, and um, it's given actually outside under the ear lobe as well as right under the chin. And it, it helps with the drooling, but too much of the medication can also cause dry mouth and swallowing difficulty. The next drug uh, that uh, this week itself FDA accepted for a review is estradafinil. Estradafinil is a drug, again, for off time. This is approved and available in Japan. Uh, and it kind of acts similar to caffeine uh, by blocking a new receptor uh, because that's not a receptor which has been targeted so far in Parkinson's disease, known as the adenosine A2A receptor. Uh, we believe that it's going to help with off time, but may also possibly reduce dyskinesias over the long term. So Isradefinil, uh, we are hoping, will be approved in the next six months. I talked a little bit about epimorphine sublingual. Uh, I talked about epimorphine injections that I use. But in Europe, epimorphine pump has been widely available and used. And what happens is here, you take a needle and it provides epimorphine under the skin with a pump. And because it is given throughout the day and in some patients day and night, it reduces the off time during the day. And in some patients also reduces the dyskinesias because we are able to reduce the dose of levodopa. 
Uh, of course, patients with dementia are not candidates for this therapy because it may cause more confusion. And we also have concerns about hallucinations. But in Europe, uh, they assess patients on how bad the hallucinations are, how bad the dementia is. Uh, and in some patients, even with those conditions, uh, do get this therapy. Right now, in clinical trials, we did not include these patients. But once it's available in practice, it may be offered for other patients too. Of course, this pump doesn't require any surgical therapy. All it requires is a needle where we can provide this therapy with. So carbidopa levodopa pump delivery is right now by having a surgical therapy where a tube is placed in the stomach. This surgery takes between 15 to 30 minutes, but it still requires a surgeon or an interventional radiologist to put this tube in. Again, patients don't like a tube going into the stomach, so other forms are being looked at, providing carbidopa levodopa subcutaneously under the skin wire pump, rather than having to do surgery and doing uh, providing levodopa from that way. There are two different companies working on providing carbidopa levodopa continuously under the skin through a pump. And again, the idea behind it is that it reduces the off time. It could be used up to 24 hours a day. And again, we believe this therapy would or should be available, hopefully, within the next couple of years. There have been immediate release carbidopa levodopa. There are at least two extended release carbidopa levodopa preparations in the market. But in spite of that, our patients still have off time. And that's why we have been struggling to use other medications to reduce off time. Two companies are now working on a better extended release carbidopa levodopa. One is what we call the accordion pill carbidopa levodopa. And what it is, it's a thin film, so to speak, which is uh, folded as an accordion and put in the capsule. And this believed to provide carbidopa levodopa, maybe taken only three times a day, providing continuous benefit. This study just completed their phase three study. Uh, we don't have the results about it. But if it is results are positive, maybe in the next year, year and a half, this would be in the market. The other one, which is just starting phase three studies, is IPX203. And the early studies have shown that it increases on time. And again, we are looking at maybe a little over two years before this drug hits the market. Another one that is a little closer for approval uh, that is already available in Europe is opicapone. Opicapone is what we call a CMT inhibitor like Encapone that is currently available in the United States. Opicapone will be used in patients with Parkinson's disease who are having off time. Compared to the current CMD inhibitors that are available, opicapone will only be used or is being used only once a day. So that would be the benefit. It uh, doesn't matter if a patient is taking immediate release carbidopa levodopa, extended release, or whatever form of carbidopa levodopa they're using. Because opicapone is used only once a day, we believe that therapy would be beneficial. Uh, benefit patients who are still having off time. So this was overall to give you a view. I, I went through a number of medications. I went through a, a, a number of different medications that work on different parts of the Parkinson's disease. So I have to uh, let you know that, that I provided you with too much benefit in the short time we have, but it also makes it exciting, not only because all these new medicines we have over, over the past two years, but also that we are going to have more new medicines, not only over the next two years, but much more over the time period over the next five to 10 years. With that, I would like to thank you for listening in, and I will open it up to any questions or comments people may have. Thank you. Dr. Pawa, that was fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time to go over the uh, lots of interesting medications which are uh, have come to market and it looks like they're on the on the horizon um, to help people with PD. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, before we take questions, I w just want to give a shout out to a couple of our viewing parties we have in Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, there's 60 um, people watching and listening to you. And in Wichita, we have a first time viewing party there with 30 folks. And in Columbus, we have another viewing party with 30 attendees. So, and that's of the 2,500 individuals who've registered um, uh, for 
for your talk. Uh, most of them clearly are people with Parkinson's disease, about half, but we have a lot of people who are you know, care partners, um, about 600, and, and um, health professionals and nurses as well um, who take advantage of, of the material that you're presenting. So thank you very much for doing that. We've uh, clearly uh, coming questions from coming all over the world, of, um, so it's not only the U.S., but 42 other countries who are, who are listening in today. So hello to everyone. So, um, you know, Dr. Pawa, I thought what you presented was really interesting because there's a, it seems like a lot of uh, medications which are being developed to really help with um, some of these basic symptoms here. And you know, a lot of them seem to be um, derivatives or, or maybe, you know, kind of new ways of formulating levodopa. What do you, how do you respond to, um, to people who say, oh, no, you know, this is the medication we've had for since the 70s, um, you know, what do you say? What do you think? Uh, what do you say to that? And what do you think is different about the levodopa formulations we have today compared to, to when it first came out? So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, dopamine is one of the most important chemicals uh, that is reduced in Parkinson's disease, and uh, replacing dopamine, which we cannot replace it directly, we have to use the prodrug levodopa uh, that goes in the brain and becomes dopamine would be the best way to treat it because we are replacing the chemical that is reduced in Parkinson's disease. We have known this for over 40 years that levodopa works great. Uh, it is most efficacious. It helps the patients a lot. The best we can do today with what we have is only 10% makes it to the brain where it is really required to be converted. So we are still losing 90% of it. Levodopa by itself is a great drug. The challenges with the drug has been uh, that, one, uh, people develop what we call off-time and dyskinesias with it. And we believe that these off-time and dyskinesias could be related to, one, the way we are delivering levodopa, that is giving a whole bunch of medicine multiple times during the day rather than providing it what happens in the brain is more physiologically or more continuously. The second challenge we face with levodopa when a person takes it to the mouth, like I said, it goes, sits in the stomach, maybe for an hour, two hours, before it makes it to the small intestine, where it is absorbed, gets into the blood. The absorption through the gut may interfere with the other amino acids that are there, then goes to the blood-brain barrier, where again, there are other amino acids that can interact before it actually makes it to the brain. So that's another long journey that occurs with levodopa. If we could have, let's say, a once-a-day levodopa or a, a patch of levodopa that provides continuous benefit throughout the day, we may not need other drugs because we believe providing the drug continuously, we would be, eliminate, we would be able to eliminate the off time as well as not have the dyskinesias. So even though this is a drug for over 40 years, which we have been going over it, we still do not have the best way uh, to provide this drug, and, and that's the challenge we have had, and that's what we are trying uh, to fix. Having said that, levodopa is still we are providing for the motor symptoms. The disease does get worse, and there are other non-motor symptoms also that come up that levodopa doesn't provide benefit for, so we do need additional therapies for. In addition, uh, levodopa doesn't cure the disease. It doesn't slow the disease. So that, those are other challenges we have. But if we look at symptomatic therapy for motor symptoms, levodopa is still our best drug, but it is not the best way we are able to give the drug. And that's why we keep working on providing this drug to the brain in a better and efficient manner. I, I, I totally uh, agree with what you just said, Dr. Paul. I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, I, I get the question asked and, and I tell people that, uh, you know, this is a, a car of the 70s. We're still driving cars, but the improvements, the bells and whistles they've done for delivery mechanisms have, have uh, I think, helped people a lot. Um, and speaking of delivery mechanisms, the inhaler, Embrija, uh, is an interesting one. Do you have any ideas that's widely available now? A uh, question uh, coming from uh, someone in Florida was asking. Yes. So Embrija, the levodopa inhaler, is available now. The thing with the Imbregia is that it is through what we call a specialty pharmacy. So it's not one of the drugs that you can take a prescription and go to your friendly neighborhood pharmacy uh, and get this drug uh, from there. Uh, the thing is, because it requires 
a special prescription that is sent to a special pharmacy because they have to get pre-approval for the drug, uh, look at the benefits for different uh, insurances that are out there, and then provide the drug. And while you're waiting for the benefits to go through, they will provide you with uh, sampling for uh, two weeks or whatever time is available from that. So that's why it is widely available. It's just through a specialty pharmacy, and that's the important difference with it. Okay, that's good to know. And and so you know, with something like that, you, we mentioned the, you know had a specific use, but you know, is it um, do you anticipate um, within your within your um, cohort of, of people with Parkinson's you see is this is this really a, a niche or is it uh, you know just another tool for you to use to help manage off symptoms and, and you know these freezing episodes or is this something you think will, would be used on a more regular basis? So the important point, like I went over earlier, was there are off time and there are off periods. The medications, when we use for off time, like I said, usually the studies show a patient has six hours of off time a day, and we reduce it by an hour. But that hour, we don't know, is it going to happen in the afternoon? Is it going to happen in the morning? Is it going to happen in the evening? So that reduction of hour is, so to speak, throughout the day, and it might even be uh, 10 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, 30 minutes in the evening, so that even though it helps the off time throughout the day, we still can't say when it is happening. Now, medications, which we call on demand, is that when the person needs that medicine. So if that person has it that, you know, I just had lunch and my medicine is not working as well, they inhale the levodopa, it bypasses the gut, it goes to the brain, and it will provide benefit within 10 minutes, lasting for about an hour, hoping by then the oral medication would work. So that gives them the benefit when they need it. Now, there are people who may need, like I said, up to five times a day, and there are people who may need it only once a week or, or once a day. So I wouldn't call it a niche uh, medication. I would call it an on-demand because when we talk about Parkinson's patients, once they have off time, and as I said, about 40% will get it in five years, it really comes down to them. If they want to have it more predictable when they want it, they can get the drug. That's what it provides. The other way I look at on-demand therapy, such as Embregia, is a patient, let's say, with migraine headaches. So a patient with migraine headaches, when they start having their headaches, they take a medication for that headache at that time. But in addition, they are also taking medications during the day so that the headaches don't occur as frequently. And that is what Embregia does, is give them that additional benefit that they can use it when they want to have an improvement in an off period. Perfect. So, so um, you know, just thinking of a lot of questions coming in about levodopa and, and Cinemet. Um, one of them, you know, again, talks about, uh, you know, basic advantages and disadvantages of, of, of starting levodopa. This is from a, um, a care partner in, in North Carolina. Do you still um, face a battle sometimes, um, you know, uh, trying to convince your, your patients that they, it's time to start levodopa? Is that something that still occurs, or is that something that you, you just hear about every now and then? So, uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, negative things about levodopa, uh, mainly because of concerns of dyskinesias. Uh, and the thing with the off time and dyskinesias, uh, there's a, a lot of wrong belief out there that if we delay the therapy, then we can also delay the off time and dyskinesias. In other words, uh, if a patient has Parkinson's in the year 2015 and they delayed levodopa to uh, 2020, then they wouldn't have the off time until 2025. That's actually a very wrong perception out there because one of the risks of off time and dyskinesias is disease severity. By that, I mean that if someone was to start the levodopa at 2015, they may get off time or dyskinesias in 2020. But if you wait till 2020, there has been a five-year progression of the disease so the risk factors for having off time and dyskinesias is much shorter. In other words, you'll get it within a year or even six months. So that doesn't benefit delaying the therapy. Uh, the second thing we do know is the longer we delay levodopa therapy, the person is actually suffering from the motor symptoms 
and are having increasing disability. So if you were to kind of look at five-year time period in people who start levodopa earlier as compared to people who start levodopa later, at a five-year endpoint, people who started levodopa earlier have much less disability than people who started levodopa later on. So again, the question comes down to is, why do we hesitate in starting levodopa? And I think the concerns are more related to the off time and dyskinesias rather than anything else. And we do have better treatment options for off time and dyskinesias, and these options are getting better and better. So we still use, so to speak, an old thinking that we should hold it, otherwise patients will have off time or dyskinesias, but we are increasingly getting better at managing these off time and dyskinesias. The other thing is even with off time and dyskinesias, Patients can function much better than a person who's not having these medicines. So for me, there should not be really a reason to delay therapy unless someone takes it and, and just cannot tolerate it, which would be a completely different reason for not using the therapy. Uh, but but I, I disagree with people who want to hold it until they reach a point that they are very disabled. Yeah, it's like reaching a point of no return. Um, well worth doing this stuff in advance. Um, so uh, another question related to this is um, uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, levodopa and or just the medications in general that you presented, um, is there, what do you think about like for a person at different stages? So I've getting several questions coming in um, from all over, you know, asking you know, for the medications you presented today or, you know, are they going to be useful for someone who's, you know, a young onset, for instance, versus someone who's, you know, much later in their disease? What can you say about, you know, the, what these treatments available? Are they, um, you know, are they specific to whether you're young onset or you're, you're developing Parkinson's in your 60s? Or does it, um, you know, do you have this in mind when you're also thinking about, you know, cases where you, who are more advanced disease? Sure. So the thing is, uh, first of all, these medications are approved for the indication, in other words, the symptoms that is present. So young patients, yes, have more off time earlier and dyskinesia earlier. So some of that therapy would be, you know, they may need it earlier rather than later. But at the same time, whether it's a young person or an older person, they still have off time, they still have dyskinesia, they still have off period. So that doesn't limit them. Uh, the other thing, let's say for psychosis, you know, psychosis usually occurs as the disease advances, but again, it's, it's not young versus older. Even the older patients are a little higher risk to have psychosis. Even younger patients can, can get psychosis from that part. Uh, the levodopa pump, for example, now that is a little bit more advanced. It's more for people who have tried the oral medications and are still having off time or dyskinesias. Uh, that's when you would use the pump for them. Uh, but again, we are not talking that advanced that, that they are wheelchair bound, although you could use it in a person who's wheelchair bound. Uh, but that would be the only therapy you would look at it for a more advanced standpoint. Again, drooling could occur very early or could occur very late. So again, that's something that can happen. So these medicines are more for the specific indication rather than in a young patient versus old patient or a young onset disease versus an older onset disease. So you're really just out there, um, you know, evaluating uh, the person in front of you and, and doing your best to, to treat the symptoms as they're presented, it, it sounds like, versus, you know, thinking about that, you know, whether they're young onset or not. Is that a fair? That's correct. Some, yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. So, so Dr. Pava, you know, um, you know, you presented some you know, a medication for blood pressure that's that's come in, and uh, you know what about people who are already on uh, medication for for um, you know low blood pressure, um, and is there a concern that uh, you know some of the medications like you know, people may be taking already con con contributing to blood pressure? Do you, would you mind just talking a little bit more about that? Right. So orthostatic hypotension, like I said, is when the blood pressure drops when a person stands up. Uh, one of the challenges uh, in general that occur with blood pressure is most of the time when a patient goes to a physician, whether it's their primary care, whether it is their cardiologist, the blood pressure is only taken in the seating position. And usually when they're seated, the, the blood pressure is good. So often uh, they may be on 
high blood pressure medicines, for example, uh, and because your blood pressure is good seated, uh, they are sent home with the medicine. But as soon as they stand up and they walk out out of the office, they already start feeling lightheaded and dizziness. So whenever a person has drop in blood pressure on standing, the first thing we recommend is backing up on their blood pressure medicines if they are taking it. Uh, and, and this is a very important point because even if a bl person had uh, been on high blood pressure medicines since they were 50s and now they are in their 60s, they may not need as much blood pressure medicine because Parkinson's itself can lower their blood pressure plus all the Parkinson's medicines on top of it can lower the medicine. So again, when, when a person starts feeling dizzy, lightheaded due to orthostatic hypotension, the first thing we do is reduce if there are blood pressure medicines on board. The second thing we, we often do is uh, uh, stuff like drinking plenty of fluids. Often Parkinson's patients don't drink enough fluids. So we start with excessive fluids, uh, making sure they're taking adequate salt in their diet, maybe using uh, Ted Ho's talkings uh, to raise the blood pressure. So we don't directly go to the medication. In spite of that, patients still have blood pressure issues, then we start adding medicines that are available, uh, mitodrine or fludrocortisone. But the challenge is in spite of those medicines, in spite of uh, what we would say non-medication treatments, patients can still have orthostatic hypotension. And that's when we add additional medicines such as droxidopa or Northera. But even then, patients are not completely helped with some of these medicines. And we still find it an unmet need because there are patients out there with Parkinson's in spite of either trying the medicines that they had side effects for or in spite of taking other medicines to raise their blood pressure, continue to have low blood pressure. Uh, so, so some people may be taking multiple medications for low blood pressure. It sounds like it can be a, a difficult thing to, to manage, um, a lot to go through in order to, to help people, but it sounds like there's also maybe a medication at the at the end of that road, if nothing to work, that, that may be helpful as well with uh, North Era. Um, and if someone is already on medications uh, for it, um, not North Thera, maybe Myrodrine, and their blood pressure is under control and they don't have dizziness or lightheadedness, does not mean that they need to switch their medication. It would be more that if they cannot tolerate it or continue to have these symptoms. That's a good point to make. Um, for, for those uh, who are listening, I just want to refer you to your screen. We've got a survey uh, up right now just to um, review um, uh, and provide feedback to Dr. Pawa on his uh, presentation. Um, and there, previously there was another um, slide um, asking you to help choose our topics for upcoming expert briefings. This is an opportunity for you, uh, the listener, to help us decide what we should be, should be presenting in our 11th expert briefing series. Uh, it also came in, um, a link to that survey also came in the email uh, for today's presentation. You know, um, Dr. Pawa, uh, I see that there's a, you know, a couple different types of, of botulinum toxin, you know, targeting drooling, and it can be helpful, I understand, for some dystonia and stuff. Is, is botulinum toxin not just the same? I mean, is, are these actually, um, you know, uh, uh, different um, drugs, or are they are they, is there something that's um, unique about these different forms that, that make them special for different uses? So uh, there are two main botulinum toxins available, or, or classes, I should say. There's A and B. Uh, we uh, have not done any studies comparing head-to-head -head A versus B for drooling to say one is better than the other. Uh, the reason why some people may use B is B, when, when was used in practice, was seen to have some side effects such as dry mouth. So from that area, it was brought down as maybe that might work with drooling. But there are only both. There is an A and B that has been tested for drooling in Parkinson's. Both have been shown to be beneficial. So it really comes down to an individual. If they have tried A and A didn't work, it might be worth trying B or vice versa for it. Uh, but again, I wouldn't have someone do A plus B or, or something like that. Uh, but I wouldn't say at this stage, if someone asks me, is there a clear cut benefit of one versus uh, A versus B? Uh, I don't have any head to head data to suggest that. All I can say is both have been used and both have been shown to be beneficial for do. Understood, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, a couple, qu couple more questions, if I may, um, before we have to wrap up. And, um, you, know, uh, you presented a, a you know, background about timavanserin for hallucinations. 
as you can imagine, we have a broad audience, and there's you know, someone um, who's listening who has a parent with, with um, you know, uh, Parkinson's disease-like symptoms in Washington State, and they're asking if, whether pimavastrin can be used for um, Lewy body dementia. So right now, pimavastrin is not approved for Lewy body dementia, and again, even with Lewy body dementia, it has to be Lewy body dementia psychosis, uh, not just for the dementia part. It has to be for the psychosis. So the drug has not been approved for Lewy body uh, dementia psychosis uh, because it has not been studied for it. Right now, studies are ongoing for that indication. Uh, if you are close to a center that's doing such a study, you may be able to enroll him or her in that study for it. But right now, it's not approved for that indication. And where would someone go to find that information uh, about studies that might be open? So one of the, the easiest way I recommend is going to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you can put in the disease, let's say Parkinson's disease, and then you can put in where you are. So if you can put in your zip code or you can put in uh, the city or the state, and it will show you all the trials related to Parkinson's disease uh, in your neighborhood. Fantastic. And one final question, maybe to give you a chance to just kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, longer answer. You know, um, we, a lot of the symptoms um, you've addressed with some new medications, uh, you know, help some non-motor symptoms and help some of the um, other uh, aspects of, you know, motor aspects of Parkinson's disease. But one, you know, there's some other, you know, troubling non-motor symptoms that people are, are experiencing, you know, um, you know, some regarding pain, uh, you know, fatigue, you know, apathy. Do you see anything uh, on the horizon uh, that's farther along than you know, maybe uh, within the time frame you specified that, that might be coming to help people um, you know, with some of these issues, like even constipation? What well, do you see? Uh, sure. So non-motor symptoms, uh, as far as Parkinson is concerned, you know, we have just started paying more attention to them because we have realized that, uh, so to speak, we have underappreciated a lot of these non-motor symptoms. Uh, having said that, uh, yes, the future, there are going to be specific medications for some of these specific indications. Uh, for example, like you said, constipation in Parkinson's. Uh, apparently, there is some uh, ongoing studies that look very positive, and if not in the next two years, maybe in the next three to four years, uh, that might be something that might be approved. Uh, the other thing is uh, there are no specific studies we still have that are looking for, let's say, fatigue or apathy. But we do believe that's a major unmet need that we have. And some of the drugs that we believe might help with uh, say fatigue or, or apathy, we are studying for some other reason. But we are also paying attention to look at it if does the fatigue and apathy improve and then paying more attention to those. So it's not due to ignoring it anymore. It is more just finding the right medication that we believe would help with specifically those symptoms. The other thing for fatigue especially is that it's pretty broad-ended. You know, people can have fatigue from Parkinson's, from the medicines they're taking, from other issues like heart issues. Uh, and again, uh, just trying in general to look at medicines for fatigue might be more challenging than let's say for apathy, where again, apathy might be more easier to find a medicine to help. All right, with that, I think we will have to conclude our um, expert briefing. Dr. Rajesh Pawa, um, Director of the Parkinson's uh, Foundation Center of Excellence at University of Kansas, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much.